What's up, y'all? Prophet David Taylor here for your weekly live prophetic word. Okay? So we've got a prophetic word for you. We're going to jump right on in. Now, remember, when you come on to the broadcast, please remember to like and share. And I went into it uh, in greater depth last week, but I'll repeat it again here briefly. Whenever a prophetic word of God is going forth, you want as many people as possible to be exposed to that word. You want to give the Lord and the Holy Spirit a chance to, to release that word to as many people as possible. Why? Because in God's word, we find life. Remember that there are three levels of word. And as a believer, you need all three. There's the written word, which is the Bible. There's Jesus the Christ, which is the living word of God. Jesus is literally the Bible made flesh, the Bible come alive. Everything the Bible says is what, what Jesus lives out in his life. And then there's the rhema word of God, the fresh breathed word of God, which normally comes through the prophetic. And that rhema is, what is God saying now? What is the Lord's judgment? What is the Lord's will? What is the Lord saying now about, uh, normally about a particular situation? Okay, so you need all three. You need the written word, the Bible. You need the living word, which is Jesus the Christ. And you need the rhema word, which normally comes through the prophetic. So if you understand that, even on a very base level, you can see then why so many people end up missing <laughs> so much of what God had for them in this life, because either they don't know the scriptures or they, they memorize scripture, but they don't really get to know the Lord. They memorize the Bible, but they don't get to know the God of the Bible, or they don't believe in or walk in the prophetic. Because for example, the Bible says, I'll give you houses you didn't build and houses and lands and all that. The Bible talks a lot about houses. But if you're looking at a house trying to decide which one to buy, that is not actually in the scripture. You have to ask the Holy Ghost, <laughs> what is the Lord saying? What, which one of these houses that you know are in front of me is actually mine? And there will be an anointing. You can do the same thing with going to college, although we go to college online these days and definitely with picking a spouse. You better ask the Holy Ghost to give you a witness. But the point I'm trying to make is that uh, it's easy to see why so many believers, and, and don't be walking around talking about that they're not saved, okay? You have to have all three levels of word. You have to know the scriptures, okay? That's the written word of God. But you also have to know the Lord, which is the scriptures come to life, which is the word made flesh, which is the Bible in action. Jesus the Christ is everything that God is, and Jesus the Christ is everything that people are meant to be. He's the son of God and the son of man. Everything that you want to find out about God is found in Jesus. And everything you want to find out about your potential as a human is also found in Jesus. So you can't just memorize scripture and not make it your business to get to know Jesus. But thirdly, you have to walk in the prophetic. Okay, so that's, I said it last week, that's why I do a weekly live prophetic word. So we can hear from God on Sunday which will set the tone for the rest of the week. Now, Sunday should not be the only time you're in the Word, but unfortunately, a lot of Christians still live that way. That's like having a sandwich on one day of the week and you don't eat again until seven days have passed. You don't treat your body like that. You're not supposed to treat your spirit like that. But unfortunately, some Christians do. So at least we need one time during the week where we, we hear from the Lord and we want to hear about what the Lord is saying now and how to apply the scriptures, the written word to our lives. Okay, so that's why you need to like and share this video. When you watch it, if you're watching it on Facebook, Periscope, YouTube, if you're listening to the podcast, or you're experiencing this content, please like it and share it uh, with others so they have a chance to hear the word of God as well. Okay, all right, we've got a prophetic word and we're going to dive right in. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for all three levels of word, oh God, your written word. Uh, Jesus, thank you for being God and man. Thank you for being the bridge between heaven and earth. Thank you for being the payment for sin and the justification for righteousness. Thank you for wrapping everything up in your life, Lord. And thank you so much, Father, for sending Jesus. And so right now, I surrender myself to you. I must decrease so you can increase. So I surrender my mind, my heart, my Lips, my teeth, my tongue, my hand, gestures, everything. I surrender myself to you, God. Breathe in me and through me and speak through me so that everything that is said is what you want, so that you might get the glory in all things. You might be glorified and that the saints might be edified and that hell might be terrified 
and that unbelievers might be challenged to repent and turn from their lives and turn to you. And I declare and decree that signs and wonders and miracles shall follow this prophetic word and all that believe it, receive its teachings and apply it will see your hand and see your mighty power and work. For it's in obedience that we prophesy and it's in faith that we, we believe and go about our daily lives. Thank you for it and we believe you for it in Jesus' name, amen. All right, amen and amen. There is a blessing on this prophetic word. So believe it, receive it, uh, apply its teachings to your lives through having the Holy Spirit show you how, how does this apply to me, okay? And what'll happen is a sign and a wonder and a miracle will manifest. And what that means is that the Spirit of God will show you his power, he'll give you a witness. Something will happen in your life to demonstrate something supernatural that the word is true. And that however you were before you heard this word was one level. But when the supernatural anointed word of God comes forth prophetically, then God can take your life to another level and help you walk more in the supernatural, which is walking more in the power of what he can do, walking more in the power of the Holy Spirit. So we must decrease so he can increase. We must let go of our natural ways so that we can grab onto his supernatural ways. That doesn't mean the natural is bad, and that doesn't mean you don't have to take care of your business in the natural. That's not what I mean when I say let go of your natural ways. So pay your taxes and eat healthy and exercise. So that's not what I mean. What I mean is the way we think and the way we do things and trying to operate our lives under our own power instead of operating under the authority and truth of the word of God and in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's how we're supposed to live as believers. Because we're supposed to live as long as we want to. We're supposed to stay healthy with full physical and mental uh, faculties as long as we live. We're supposed to accomplish our purpose in life. And we're supposed to pass our baton to the next generation. And we're not supposed to be sick. We know, you don't have to die from sickness. Okay, You can die when your work is done. That's our inheritance. That's what you get when you follow Jesus. But you got to believe it. And you got to know where that is in the Word. And you got to meditate it. And then you have to put some works to that and live like you believe that and, you know, eat some healthy food and don't fill your body full of fat, salt, sugar, and cholesterol. Okay? <laughs> All right. All right. Today's prophetic word. Today's prophetic word is no good. What would you say, Prophet Taylor? I said <laughs> today's prophetic word is no good. Okay? Let's look at our scripture reference. Our scripture reference is the book of Romans, okay? This is a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the Christians in Rome. Uh, that's why it's called Romans, and this is in the New Testament, and this is right after Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, okay? Remember that the books, book of Acts establishes the first church, the early church, right after Jesus left. So right after Jesus left, and Peter and them take over and begin to establish his kingdom and continue his work on earth, that's what the book of Acts is, is all those early days. And then pretty much after the book of Acts, pretty much we stay with Paul and Paul's teaching until we come back around to uh, James and John. And then Hebrews, some say Hebrews is written by Paul. Some say Hebrews is written by Apollos. Some say Hebrews is written by Luke. But the majority, the bulk of the New Testament after you get past Acts and before you get to James, John, and, Re and Peter and Revelation and Jude, is Paul. Okay? All right. So we're going to look at Romans chapter 7. Uh, I'm going to read most of it, but not all at once. So I'm going to read a few verses and go into it, and then we'll look at some other verses as we go. So let's start with Romans chapter 7, verse 15. Romans chapter 7, verse 15. I'm reading out of the King James Bible. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more, or not really I that do it, but sin that dwelleth or lives in me. That's 15, 16, and 17. So let's break that down because we want to find out what the Holy Ghost is trying to say to us today, Sunday, November 1st as we go forward into the last two months of 2020. The Bible says, For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. 
What you will discover as a Christian is that there's a war going on in your members. There's a war going on in your mind. There's a war going on in your soul. There's a war going on in your body. Now, uh, just as an aside, because this is not going to be about demonology, people always ask, can Christians be possessed? And that answer is no. No, you can't be possessed where a demon jumps in your spirit and takes over, but you can be oppressed. Because if that demon truly had taken over, it couldn't be cast out. But you can be oppressed. You can have some oppression from the devil where some things have set up shop in your life. And unbeknownst to you, you're allowing them. Maybe some hurt, maybe some damage, maybe some misperception, some wrong information. And so the devil uses those things to set up something unclean and something unhealthy in your life. And then you ended up walking in it because you didn't know any better. That's why the devil tries so hard to hurt us when we're young. Because if you get hurt when you're young, you will acclimate to that hurt and then your personality starts to form around that hurt and then you think that hurt is actually you. That happens to a lot of people. A lot of you are, well, that's just the way I am. A lot of that is not just the way you are. Like, you were hurt. And so your personality didn't finish forming and developing apart from that hurt. But that hurt wrapped itself around your soul. And so a lot of Christians, everybody needs deliverance, but a lot of Christians need deliverance. You need that demon cast out and you need the hurt healed. So let's look at it again. Demon cast out, hurt healed. Then your soul comes back alive and you become more of what you were supposed to be. You'll discover when you get demons cast out, when you get unclean spirits broken off, when you get things broken off of your life that the enemy put there, you'll feel the freedom. You'll feel the relief. You'll feel the weight lift off you. And then when your soul has been like this for so long, and then it gets the healing that it needs, and you can live again and laugh again and love again and be productive, you would never want to go back to your damaged self. Even if your damaged self was around for a very long time, even if you thought for most of your life that that damaged version of you was the right version of you. So we need to break the demons off. That's deliverance. And we need to get the soul healed so you can come back alive. Okay? But that's the spiritual level. There's also a soulish level, mind, will, emotions. And then there's a physical level. And this is another place that people get confused. Everything that happens to you is not demons. Did you hear me? <laughs> Everything that happens to you is not demons. Okay? We have an enemy on the inside and it's called the flesh. Now, the flesh is not talking about your body. There's nothing wrong with your body. Sometimes people use that term interchangeably to refer to your physical body and what I'm talking about. But the flesh, as the Bible defines it, that word flesh there, it means carnal. And it comes from a word meaning, a root word means meat. And that's uh, carne in Spanish is meat. But what it's basically saying is, when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, what they did was separate from God and pretty much go their own way. God gives us the option to walk away from him, but he tells us before we do that if you separate from me, you're going to die. So he told Adam that if you eat the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and what that tree is, is the ability to grow a conscience and separate from me. So instead of trusting me, instead of depending on me, instead of living by my spirit and your spirit, God was telling Adam, you can grow your own conscience and separate from me and live by your senses, live by your own way, separate from me and do what you want. But God said, the day you do that, you're going to die. Now, in English, it says, thou shalt surely die. In Hebrew, it says something closer to dying, thou shalt die. Okay, so what God actually told Adam is that you're going to create cycles of death if you eat the fruit from that tree. So a lot of people get confused when they read in the scriptures about the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So they, they listen to what the devil says, it's why would God withhold knowledge from us? That's not what that tree was. That tree was not God withholding knowledge from us. That tree was God saying, you can separate from me and know good and evil for yourself instead of trusting me. That's what that means. God was saying, instead of trusting me, depending on my word and depending on my spirit, to be your Lord, to be your God, and instead of me giving you commandments, and you stay one with me, you can know good and evil for yourself and make your own decisions, separate from me. But when you do that, 
the spirit dies, you lose your connection to God, and then all you have left is your senses. And that's why people that aren't born again are so adamant that only what they can perceive or prove or only what science says is real. But there's a whole spiritual world that you tap into by faith that doesn't have anything to do with sight, sound, smell, taste, or touch. But when Adam separated from God, we died. His spirit died. And then many years later, his body went back to the dust. Because the only way for us to live is to stay attached to God. So God gave mankind the freedom to choose. God created us one with him. God created us innocent and pure like he is. God created us in fellowship with him, but told Adam, you don't have to stay if you don't want to. Okay? Because God loves us enough to set us free, to let us know that we don't have to serve him if we don't want to. Because we serve the Lord because we choose to, and God is not going to have it any other way. God does not accept for service. If you think that, then you've been around a bunch of mean old religious people. Okay? Because mean old religious people, remember I told you I called them the huffy stuffies? The huffy stuffies are good for that. And so are the colonizers, the slave owners, taught you theology, that taught you that being a Christian was how much abuse you can take and still keep smiling. That's not, oh Lord, that's not the Bible. They didn't even have to do that in the Old Testament. So God gives us the ability as humans, he gives all these creatures that ability, but we're the only ones that can be redeemed. Uh, God gives us that ability to step away from him and detach from him and live on our own if we want to. And God says that that is death. God says the day you step away from me, you create cycles of death, you die. It doesn't matter how you feel. It doesn't matter how it looks. Okay? So that's what happened when Adam ate that fruit. And it's not an apple. The Bible does not say that Eve ate an apple. That's what pictorial accounts of that event have told us. The Bible says she ate from the fruit of the tree. The Bible does not specifically call it an apple. Just for, for future reference, just FYI for your information, that's not in Genesis where Eve ate the apple. The Bible never said it was the apple. Okay, it said it was the fruit of the tree, the knowledge of good and evil. Eve did it first, then Adam listened to her, and then he did it. And then when he did it, the fall happened because he was the head. Because Adam had the authority from God to, to dress and keep the Garden of Eden, to name the animals, and to have complete dominion over the earth. And, by the way, God did not just give us dominion over the earth. God gave us dominion over the earth around. Everything under the sun, all the star systems, all the planets, that's all ours. Sometimes even including the sun, because when Joshua was fighting, he reached up to heaven and told the sun to stand still, and God honored that. See, because God is not selfish or stingy. So God started us on the planet earth, but actually everything, not just in our solar system, not just in the Milky Way, all of the stars under the sun, excuse me, all of the galaxies, all of everything that's in the earth realm actually belongs to us humans, if you didn't know that. So God just started us on earth, but we were meant to expand to fill the galaxy, and that's why the galaxy is always expanding. Science tells you that, that the universe is always expanding. That's because it was meant to be filled with us as humans, taking dominion over planet after planet after planet after planet, if you didn't know that. So God had a grand and glorious plan for us when he thought of us. And Adam and Eve messed that up. Okay? So when they did that, they separated from God. Their spirits went dark. They died in the spirit. And then once your spirit dies, then later on, your soul and your body is going to follow suit. That's why we age. That's why there's crow's feet and wrinkles. That's why there's sickness and disease. That's also why when the bodies go on the ground, they decompose. All the things that you hate about life came from sin, not God, okay? It came into this world the day that the one with dominion over this world, which was Adam, which was us, decided to separate from God and go out on his own. Then he died and he brought death into all this. You see that? Well, something happened uh, or, or more things happened on that fateful day. One of the things that happened was not just that they separated from God and lost the original nature that we had. The original nature of people is to be exactly like God. That is why we have in us something that I like to call echoes of Eden. And echoes of Eden are where there are things that we had in the Garden of Eden 
that we still long for, and we still long for way down deep inside because they're things that we were meant to have. That's why as people, we still have those echoes. I'll give you an example. An example of an echo of Eden is the scripture says that, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. One of the deepest desires we have as humans is to be naked without shame. And I don't mean just, you know, without any clothes. I don't mean that. I mean, being able to be your full self, your whole self, and still be loved. Everybody wants that. Males, females, young, old, military, civilian, everybody wants that. Everybody wants the ability with at least one other person in your life to, again, I'm not talking about physical nakedness. I'm talking about soul, self-nakedness, meaning, can I show you all of me? Can I show you my good points and my bad points? Can I show you my strengths and my weaknesses? Can I show you not just my successes because we have to put our successes out there to be successful. But you know, you don't want to show people your failures. But deep down inside, we long to be loved on the level of being able to fail in front of someone and still be loved. You know where that comes from? That's an echo of Eden because we had it before they sinned. Adam and Eve were naked in every possible way, physically naked, but also there's nothing between them. Nothing in their souls, nothing in their spirits, nothing in their bodies that they couldn't share. That's why we long for that so badly. As humans, we I don't care what you say. From the time we are children to the time we are very, very old. The only thing that changes is that you learn how to hide that part of yourself because you realize it's not for everyone to see. And you also realize most people can't handle it because most people can't handle it. And so most people, wise people learn you just to you know give your whole self to God. He's the only one that can take all of you all the time. <laughs> Let me say that one more time. God is actually the only person that can take all of you all the time. So there's nothing about you that you could hide from the Lord, but there's nothing about you that you have to hide from the Lord because his love and his grace and his mercy are greater than anything you could say or do. He already knows who you are. He already knows every day of your life before you live it. Okay. So he's the one that you can truly find that type of nakedness with, and it won't be a problem. <laughs> if you try to accomplish that with, you know, your spouse or, you know, there's just some things people can't handle. Or your best friends, there's some things people can't handle. So let me give you a principle. Never forget what I'm about to say. People can't handle their own sins. What makes you think they can handle yours? Good God Almighty. So anyway, so on that fateful day when Adam and Eve sinned, something got created. They didn't just lose the old nature of God where we, would want, where we were one with God, where the Holy Spirit fully indwelt our spirit, and there was no difference between us and God. As Father, Son, and Holy Ghost flowed, so man flowed through spirit, soul, and body. God is three in one. We're three in one. Okay, we were his image and his likeness. Okay. But when they sinned, they didn't just lose that old nature. They created a new one. That new nature was created based on what Adam and Eve did. And what Adam and Eve did was they used two kinds of lust and pride. One kind of lust. Now, if you don't know what lust is, lust is not desire because there's nothing wrong with desire. Desire comes from God. Lust is inordinate desire. Lust is desire out of control. Okay? Not desire but out of control desire or inordinate, meaning inappropriate or not necessary. And that is demonstrated in the fact that God gave them all the fruit trees of the garden and all the vegetation and all the, you know, seeds, nuts and grains, the legumes, the beans. There's nothing that grows from the ground or from a tree that God told them they couldn't have. He said, of every tree in the garden, thou mayest freely eat. That's in Genesis. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of that, okay? For the day ye eat thereof, ye shall surely die. So in other words, God gave them plenty of food. And here come the devil talking about, did God say you shouldn't eat from every tree in the garden? The devil's like, mm -hmm, you're not going to die. God's holding out on you. Because he knows that they eat from that tree, then you're going to be like God. Blah, blah, blah. All that stuff he told Eve, and she bought it, okay? But they didn't have a lack of food, that's my point. 
they lusted after something that they didn't need. And there's two kinds of lust. There was the lust of the eyes and there was the lust of the flesh. So in other words, it's not like they was hungry. <laughs> How are you going to be hungry when God has literally given you all the carrots in the world? All the pineapple in the world, literally, that's not an exaggeration. All the coconuts, all the red delicious apples, all the gala apples, all the oranges, all the peanuts, all the pecans, all the almonds, okay? All the cashews, okay? Uh, anything you wanted that comes from the ground or comes from a tree, they had it and they had it in buckets. I'm talking about the world was fresh. You know how it is when you go to the grocery store in the morning and they just put the fresh stuff out? Well, imagine the whole world, it just dropped off of God's fingertips. He just made it. That world was fresh, baby. I just, uh, I just imagine that all the time. The freshness of that first week of creation when Adam woke up and God said, oh, that's yours. What, what did that look like? Because you're talking about some, that's some freshness right there. Them sweet potatoes. Sweet potatoes. Okay? So in other words, there was nothing that grew from the ground that could be eaten, that they couldn't have eaten. They weren't lacking in food. But here come the devil talking to Jane, and here come Eve listening to that instead of listening to the word of God and her husband. And then here come Adam listening to her, even though he knew all that was wrong. And so what they did was they walked in lust, meaning we don't need his fruit and we don't need uh, this food because we're not hungry. So their flesh lusted, which is why we have problems with gluttony. Because you know how sometimes you can eat and then you can eat till you full and then you can eat till you bust and then you can eat until you have problems with food and starts really messing your body up. You get into morbid obesity, stuff like that. That's lust of the flesh. I don't need the food, but I'm just craving more and more and more. And no matter how much I eat, I just crave more and more and more to the point where it gets unhealthy. See, that's an inordinate desire. That's lust. That's why some of, some of us struggle with gluttony. And that's why many of us struggle with our weight. Because it doesn't matter how full you are. If you see some potato chips, you're going to eat them. And you can eat the whole bag. You can have just had a seven-course meal and somebody put some potato chips or some french fries or some Oreos. And your face be like, well. <laughs> and you're going to go and go and go. Well, see, that's lust of the flesh. You fool. You don't need that food, but you desire it anyway. Where we got that from was that is exactly what Adam and Eve did that day. They did not need that food. And the Bible says that, um, well, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, but anyway, those are the two kinds of lust. Lust. You see it, you want it. Sometimes you've been in situations where you've gone window shopping for anything. Window shopping online or in person or a combination. And it's really funny. Because sometimes when you get that thing home, it doesn't look the same to you. <laughs> and sometimes when you get that thing home, you have buyer's remorse. But sometimes you bought it because you saw it. Same thing happens if your parents have any kind of food. I don't care who you are, and I don't care how full you are, and I don't care how well you can cook. If mom and them make something, you're going to want that. If you see it, you can have just gotten through eating it. If you see it, you're going to, ooh, mama, give me some. You can do that with a pack of gum. If you sit anywhere, a concert hall, a baseball game, church, you sit anywhere with your kids, your kids can be minding their business. And all you have to do is pull out a pack of gum and say, ooh, daddy, give me some. Ooh, daddy, can I have some? They wouldn't think about no gum until they saw you had it. Okay? Because that's where we are now as humans. Because Adam and Eve did that and they created this new nature that's cursed. And this new nature that's the opposite of what God had in mind. So now you see something and you want it. You don't need it. Your credit card don't need it. Your waistline don't need it. Your house don't need it, but you want it anyway. And you just got to have it. Okay. That's lust of the eyes. You saw it, you wanted it. And then there's lust of the flesh, which is some type of physical pleasure that you don't need. You know, you're full. You got plenty of food, but you're like, nope, give me some more until you get to the point where now your weight's out of control. Now your sugar's out of control. Now you're... Your, your cholesterol is out of control. Now your blood pressure is out of control because just give me more, give me more, give me more, can't get enough. You see that? That's a lust. That's inordinate desire. And then there's a third one called the pride of life. And the devil told Eve that God was holding out on her and that if she ate that fruit, she, she would level up. She'd get a glow up. That God was basically lying to her and that 
there was another level above where she was that could be more like God, more on God's level. And God didn't want her to have that. That's why God told her not to eat the fruit. And Eve bought that. And so the Bible says that she saw that the fruit of the tree uh, was desired to make one be wise. That's what we call the pride of life. For the desire for one to be wise in their own eyes is pride. What that means is that you saying that God don't know what he's talking about, but I do. Okay, see, that's pride. And everything that we walk in in our lives that's not from God is pride. And the Lord had to show me that because you won't realize how much pride you walk in until the Lord does pride processing on you. And you realize that some, in some cases for years, you've been arguing with the maker. You've been telling the one that invented it all that it don't go like that. Really? Show me the blueprints where you invented it and I'll stop talking. We argue with the maker over ourselves all the time. Because God tells us who we are. And we say, uh uh, they're not talking to me. You turn around, they're talking to me, especially when the Lord first calls you. When the Lord first calls you, you, you wonder a lot. Did he make a mistake? I know you didn't call me, you know, because we're arguing with the maker. We're trying to tell him, I can't be what you're saying because this, 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 and this. But God is always right, and God will keep speaking to what he made until he, what he made comes to the surface. And you realize that he's right, and you are not. But the desire to make oneself be wise, meaning the devil told Eve to disobey God, go off on her own, and that would make her smarter. That was a lie. That made her dead. One more time, the devil tells you to disobey God, go off on your own, and that's going to make you smarter. That's going to make your life better. That's a lie. It's going to make you dead. But Eve bought it. And she ate that fruit. Adam knew that wasn't right, but ate anyway. And so the pride of life was born, meaning now, now that we are separated from God and now that we're living only by our senses and now that we no longer live by God's word and God's spirit, we think we know how all this goes. And that's the root of the problem for so many people in so many areas of their lives. You are busy trying to tell life how life is supposed to work as if you invented life. <laughs> I don't care what area you're talking about, you didn't invent it. Money, sexuality, children, marriage, family, politics, governmental structures, diet, the human body, genealogy, legacy, astronomy. I don't care what you're talking about. I don't care music, acoustics. Okay, I don't care what field of study you're talking about. You didn't invent it. You didn't invent it. It didn't start when you started. Well, what about inventors down through the ages? Inventors down through the ages, I'm an inventor, I'm a creative person. Inventors down through the ages take elements that are already there and combine them into something, but you had to have something there to work with. You see that? All that basic raw material that we have to work with, like when we make steel beams, the Holy Ghost doesn't make steel beams, but the Holy Ghost put the steel ore in the ground and we mine it and refine it and make the beams. We couldn't make the beams if the metal ore wasn't in the ground. We couldn't have gold watches if gold ore wasn't in the ground. We couldn't have any plant-based food, any plant-based diet, if the Lord hadn't already planted all the plants and vegetations in the ground. You see that? God's the inventor, and we take what he gave us, and then we can combine it in fun and in interesting ways. Like, uh, I, I make some really good chili. Uh, I made some chili. I gave my son some chili last night, and, you know, he loved it because my chili's good. So I combined, you know, the sauce and the spices and the beans and the meat. But I didn't invent <laughs> any of that. You see that? And that's where people get confused. You're trying to tell God how all of this works. That's pride. You didn't invent, not as old folks would say, nail lick of it. You didn't invent near lick of it. Your parents didn't invent you. Your father sired you, meaning he released his seed inside of your mom. Your mother did not invent you. Your mother carried you. If you don't believe that's true, ask a pregnant woman, what color are your child's eyes? She don't know. Ask a pregnant woman, how tall will your child be when they're 10 years old? She don't know. Ask a pregnant woman or an expecting father, 
Uh, how much athletic ability is your child going to have? They don't know. Ask a pregnant woman and expecting father, what kind of voice range is your child going to have? Are they going to be uh, tenor, alto, soprano, bass, baritone? They don't know. You know why your parents don't know? Because your parents don't make you. Now, sometimes we, we, we talk like we made our kids, but we do not actually make children. As men, we sire them. We release our seed inside of the woman. And as women, women carry them. The seed gets fertilized, but God knits the child together in the uterus of the woman, and then the baby comes out. God is actually one that makes people. You don't, Your parents don't make you. Okay? So that's what I mean when I, I know that's news to some of y'all. I know that's the first time in your life you heard that, some of you. Uh, <laughs> so God is the inventor of all things. And trying to tell God how something is supposed to go is nothing but pride. That's why so many people have unhappy marriages. You never bothered to ask the one that invented marriage, how does this go? I'm going to say that one more time. That's why so many people have unhappy marriages. The reason your marriage isn't happy is because, because remember when God made it, he said, behold, it was very good. So there's only one time in creation where God said something was not good. And that's what he said, Genesis 2.18. Uh, it is not good that the man should be alone. So God looked at Adam and said, it's not good for him to be by himself in the world for a variety of reasons. So what God did was God made the female image of him. Genesis 1 is general descriptions. Genesis 2 focuses in on specifics. In Genesis 1, 27 and 28, it said, in the image of God created he them, male and female created he him. So God made mankind in his image, but he split us into two genders. In Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, uh, it gets more specifics about how that happened. And uh, Adam had just got through naming the animals and realizes there was a pair bonding system. But Adam saw that there wasn't really anybody around that looked like him. And God said, you're right, son. It's not good for you to be alone. I will make a helper that's fit for you. So then God took some substance from Adam and built a woman and brought the woman to the man. And then Adam knew instantly that this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. You see that? Well, that's how all of that got started. So how in the world can you possibly expect, excuse me, to have a good marriage and you never bother to ask the one that invented marriage, how, how, how does this work? See that? That's pride. Like I said, you'll be surprised how much pride you walk in on a daily basis until you ask the Lord to show it to you. It's called pride processing. And it's something that the Lord wants to do on all of his children so he can begin to wash away all the ideas we have that are not like his ideas, because his ideas are right. His ideas are the ideas of the creator, the one that invented it all. So here we come as created beings trying to tell him it don't go like that. See, that's pride. So that is what Adam and Eve created the day they actually ate the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and grew a conscience, stepped out on their own, stopped being God conscious, disconnected from God and the Holy Spirit and died, just like God told them they would, and grew their own conscience, their own thinking based on sensory-based perception and the wisdom of man. That's why it always kills us. Because no matter how smart we think we are, it's still gonna produce death if we don't do what the Lord said do. So that's lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Those are the three elements that make up what the Bible calls the flesh nature. So when the Bible is talking about the flesh, again, it's not talking about your body. It's talking about the lust of the eyes. It's talking about the lust of the flesh, inordinate you know, physical pleasure, and the pride of life. Those three things make up what we call the flesh nature. That's what the Bible's talking about when it says the flesh. So let's read that again. Uh, let's read, well, we read 15, 16, and 17. Now I'm, I'm going to read verse 18. Romans chapter 7, verse 18. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, there's that word, dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. Okay, again, Romans 7 and 18. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, in that sin-cursed nature, that is separate from God, that wants nothing more than everything it sees and everybody it wants to sleep with 
and every piece of food that it wants and to run life on its own because can't nobody tell me nothing that's the flesh so that's why you can't listen to these people that say that they're not sinners by birth we're all born just like that if you don't keep the taste of sugar out of your child's mouth as long as possible your child's gonna want cake for breakfast cookies for lunch and candy for dinner <laughs> Your child gonna grow up with no teeth. That sugar gonna eat them teeth away before that child is six years old. Why? Because that sinful nature is there in all of us because that's what Adam and Eve did and then they had kids. Once they had kids, the kids can only, kids are the fruit of your body. So just like orange seeds produce oranges and apple seeds produce apples, people seeds produce people. Once Adam and Eve sinned and became corrupted, that means all they could produce in terms of their children could be other corrupted individuals like themselves. That's where we get it from. Okay, That's why we're all born in sin, because that first family sinned and passed it on to all of us. But the scripture says, I know that in me that is in my flesh, in that old, cursed, separate from God nature dwells no good thing. It ain't no good. Okay, The Bible just told you it ain't no good. Now, that's important that you understand. I'm going to read the verses after to help you understand how to make a distinction. But on this point, you need to understand that that flesh nature, that curse nature is no good. There's nothing good or life-giving that's going to come out of your flesh ever. Anything that comes out of the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, or the pride of life is going to produce death. Nothing good is going to come from it. I know we don't like it because it feels good, it smells good, it looks good, it sounds good, and we think it's a good idea. How many times have you been in a situation where something looked good, smelled good, sounded good, and you thought it was a good idea, and then later on you're like, what was I thinking? I've been there, and if you tell the truth, you have to. You know why? That was your flesh. That was that sinful nature. That's not you. That's it. But it is in you as long as you are in this mortal body, because that's how Adam passed it on. So that's not you, but it is in you, in this mortal body, and also in your spirit, because when we go to heaven, everything in us has to be purged. You have to go through the fire, your spirit, your soul, and then ultimately your body have to be cleansed to fully enter into the heavenly kingdom where there is no sin. So that old nature has got to be purged out. So in the final analysis, when we stand before God in judgment, fire is going to be involved. So God can once and for all finally burn the last traces of that old nature and that old life out of us. But as long as we're here in earth in these mortal bodies, that flesh nature is not us, but it is in us. Very important that you understand that. So it says, for I know that in me that is in my flesh dwell in no good thing, no good, it ain't no good. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. Ah. So Paul is saying, I, I have a will. I'm trying to make a choice, but the execution. <laughs> I'm trying, Paul said, I'm trying to make good choices here, but the execution of actually actually living it out, actually making it happen, making it happen. Paul said, I can't find it. Then we're going to drop to verse 19. For the good that I would do, for the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me, or sin that lives in me. Now, there it is. Now, remember I told you, you hear me say it all the time, don't be listening to these people that say that the Bible is old or archaic or not relevant. Just because I'm reading from a translation using you know, older English, King James English, okay? Just because I'm reading that, it doesn't mean that the truths of what the Bible is saying are wrong or old because truth don't never get old. Truth is eternal. So don't let the translation throw you. That's what a lot of critics of the Bible say. That it's old, it's archaic, it's written umpteen years ago, blah, 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 blah. No, no, no. It's you're living it out every day because the Bible just told you that there are many times in life where there's something good that you want to do, something you know you need to do, but it's like you can't do it. And then there's some stuff you know you ain't been more got no business doing it than my left shoe, and you're just doing it all the time. That's because of the curse of sin. That's that backwards nature. That's why we're backwards. If you've ever struggled with something and you wonder, why do I love something that's killing me? 
Why do I love something that don't love me back? It's because of that backwards nature. That's why. That's not God. It's that backwards nature that makes you lust and make you full of pride. In it, there's nothing good in it. There's no good decisions that come from it, and they all produce death. Okay? But verse 20 says, Now if I do that, I would not, meaning I find myself doing stuff I don't really want to do. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth or lives in me. Very, very important. Very, very important. And as you need to understand the difference between you and your flesh. Stop beating yourself up for the desires of your flesh because the Bible already told you it ain't no good. You cannot be surprised that in your flesh nature it's full of no good stuff because it's the thing that's separate from God. It's the thing that is dead to God. It's the thing that's the opposite from God. That's why it's no good because God is good. Everything that God says, does, and is, is good. And when he created us, he meant for us to be just like that. They sinned and created this backwards flesh nature. And now that flesh, flesh nature is the opposite of everything God is. And now it's the opposite of all that. And now we don't, you don't ever want to do what God says. But that's not you. That's not you. That's the best news all day that that's not you. That's not you. That's it. It is in you. But it is not you. That's why you find yourself struggling. That's why you find yourself in the middle of that internal war. Uh, if you want a practical example, I'll give you a very common one. A practical, practical example is when you have to say, I'm sorry. Do you know why some people can't say, I'm sorry? Or they can't say, I was wrong? That would be pride. That's your pride. Now, there's a practical example of what I'm talking about. It's your pride that won't allow you to admit that you were wrong because you know you were wrong. Obviously, the decision didn't work out. The results of the decision were bad, and that's as plain as day. But for somehow you're sitting up there with your jaws tight. So we're just... <laughs> and for some reason, you can't say that you're sorry. That ain't nothing but pride. Don't you know how many families would have been healed by now if somebody just said they were sorry? Don't you know how, how many marriages could have been mended by now if somebody just said, I was wrong? I was wrong. I know I walked around for a long time and didn't talk to you. I gave you the silent treatment. Or I know that, you know, we haven't been dealing with what we need to deal with. Or I know I started yelling and losing my temper and said some things I shouldn't have, say, shouldn't have said. Or I know, you know, I brought your parents in this, you just like your mama or you brought my parents in, and that's why I don't like your daddy and all that. And I'm, I'm wrong, baby. I'm wrong. I had no business bringing your parents in this. I don't have nothing to do with this. I'm yelling and screaming about a bunch of stuff that's not even, you didn't even do anything. I'm wrong, and I'm sorry. I've been walking around acting like we didn't have nothing to talk about. And just giving you the silent treatment, just lie, 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 trying to ignore what's happening. I'm wrong. I'm wrong. We do have some stuff to talk about, and I'm sorry. And I'm wrong for acting that way. Do you know how many marriages could be healed like that if people said that? But it takes us a little bit to say something like that, and some people ain't going to never say it. You're going to have to wrap your head around that. Some people are, hear what I'm about to say, some people are not going to apologize until they stand before God Almighty in judgment. So that's why I did that. I did my last No More Genies, No More, Just Twi no More Genies 28 on forgiveness. Part of forgiveness is acknowledgement. But you have to take the acknowledgement step and apply it yourself. Meaning, you cannot spend the rest of your life waiting on the person that did you wrong to apologize. Because hear me again, I'm going to say it again. Some people aren't going to ever apologize. And when I say ever, I mean ever. I mean ever. They're going to hit their grave and they're going to never say, I'm sorry for what I did to you. They're not even going to say it was wrong. Okay? That's why you can't let your life get hung up on that. So anyway, go watch that video, No More Genius 28, because I break down what forgiveness is and what it isn't, isn't how to do it. But the point I'm trying to make is that's a practical example of when there's something you know you should do, but there's something that seems to be fighting against you from doing it. That thing that's fighting against you from taking responsibility, from admitting that you were wrong and saying that you were sorry is pride. And there's your proof that it's in all of us. So what the Holy Ghost wants me to tell everybody today, <clears throat> and this is for me too, 
is to let go of your guilt over your flesh. Because your flesh ain't going to never be any good. You think it's going to get better with time? <laughs> if your flesh got better with time, that would mean that only young people made mistakes. <laughs> that would mean that after people have lived many decades, that they got rid of all that. That's not true. Okay? Your flesh is never going to be any good. No, not ever. So the Holy Ghost wanted me to release to myself and to all that are listening to this message to understand, to stop feeling guilty and ashamed because of the desires of your flesh. That's not you. The Bible just told us that's not you. That sin that lives in you is in you, but it is not you. Okay? So maybe next time I'll ask Holy Ghost next time because we need to finish the conversation because Paul finishes the conversation in chapter 7 about uh, the struggle and what, what do I do about the struggle? Because if you are an unbeliever and you're not born again, there's nothing you can do. You don't have enough power inside of yourself. You're still in your sins. Your spirit is still disconnected from God. You are not saved. You're not full of the word. You're not full of the Holy Ghost. You will have no power to overcome your flesh. You will find yourself gambling all your money away and wishing you could stop, and you can't. You'll find yourself sleeping with all these people wishing you could stop being promiscuous, but you can't. You'll find yourself overeating, smoking. Name anything or anything uh, that's uh, an inner sin like racism or temper or profanity, anything like that. If you're not saved, you're not going to win. You can't overcome that nature on your own. I know you think you can. That's pride in and of itself. But you cannot overcome that nature. It's not going to happen. And you're going to try and try and try and try. Why do you think people fall off the wagon? They've been clean and sober for four, five, four, five, six, seven, eight years. They have one drink and it all starts back up again. Just one. Okay? Because you cannot beat that flesh nature on your own. But the good news is, is that you can get born again and get full of the Word of God and get full of the Holy Ghost and get full of Jesus Christ. He gives you the power to beat that flesh nature. It's not something we can do on our own. And you can try and try and try all you want to. It's not something we can do on our own. So right now, those of you that aren't saved, uh, becoming saved, becoming born again, becoming a Christian, becoming alive to God again, getting your spirit reborn and reattached to God, okay, is as simple as A, B, C. A, admit that you are a sinner. And I just showed you we're all born in sin. A, admit you are a sinner. B, believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, come down from heaven, died on the cross for your sins, resurrected on the third day. C, confess that all that with your mouth as you are believing it in your heart. Admit, believe, confess. And if you do that, then you are saved. You are born again. You have just become a Christian. So let me lead you in the prayer. Repeat these words after me. Father, I come before you to admit that I'm a sinner. I was born a sinner. I live in sin, God, and I can't even control or fix myself because I'm a sinner. But God, I believe that you sent Jesus Christ, that he's the son of God, that he walked this earth like a man, that he died on the cross for my sins. He was buried, rose again the third day. And right now, Father, I confess that with my mouth as I'm believing in my heart that Jesus is the son of God. And now, Jesus, I ask you to come into my life, come into my heart and save me and make me born again. Thank you, God, for saving me. Thank you, Father, Heavenly Father, for now being my Father and my God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. It's just that simple. If you follow that prayer, you just got saved. You just got born again. Does not matter how you feel. Doesn't matter how it looks. It happened, okay? The natural birth is your father releases his seed inside your mom. Your mom's egg gets fertilized, and then over the course of about nine months, you grow, then your mother goes into labor and pushes you out. That's the natural birth. The spiritual birth is Jesus was nailed to the cross and all of the sin that Adam let in, they put on him. He suffered and bled and died. He took all of that sin into his body. That was the labor process in the spirit. And then they put him in the ground and three days later he resurrected. He wasn't just raised from the dead, which means he came back. He was resurrected from the dead, which means he was raised to die no more. He beat death, and he couldn't die anymore. 
So he actually was resurrected from that grave. And so because he did that, that's actually the birth process in the spirit. That he took all the sin in his body and it got buried. It got paid for. But because those sins weren't his own, they were ours and not his, death couldn't hold him because death had no legal right to hold Jesus because Jesus wasn't a sinner. Those sins were ours, not his. That's why Jesus was able to resurrect from the grave. And then because the penalty was paid, now if we believe on him by faith, God applies that righteousness to our account and makes us born again, makes us saved, makes us just as if we had never sinned in the first place. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. There's nothing like God's salvation. You can't even compare it to anything. So that's the spiritual birth process. So that's why it's not based on how you feel or how you look or shaking or, ooh, I feel something, prophet. No, that's not it. That's the physical birth where your mother feels you pushing out. Remember, Jesus had all the feeling on the cross when he was paying for the sin. That was the labor, the spiritual birth. All we have to do is ABC, admit, believe, and confess. Believe it and receive it. That's the spiritual birth, okay? So remember, this stuff does not get complicated. Don't let some mean old religious huffy stuffy complicate it for you. This stuff is simple. You got born the first time, your father released a seed and impregnated your mom, your mom pushed you out nine months later. If you want to get born the second time, Jesus took the sins on the cross, that was the labor, buried in the ground, but could not legally be held by sin or, or the grave or death or hell because the sins were not his own. So he got raised up. He's free from sin. He takes that righteousness. And if you would ABC, if you admit, believe, confess, he applies that to your account. And then your spirit gets born again. Your spirit comes alive again and it gets reattached to God. And then all of the benefits of God's kingdom, you now become eligible, <clears throat> excuse me, because you're now a part of the family. So everything that, that my father left, I'm eligible for because I'm my father's son. Okay? Well, everything that Jesus writes in the New Testament as his last will and testament, I'm not eligible for because I am now a son of the Heavenly Father because of the rebirth experience. It's not complicated. It ain't complicated. It ain't complicated. Don't be listening to religious people or colonizers or slave owners that try to complicate it for you. They tell you that skin color have anything to do with it. ABC don't have nothing to do with the color of your skin. Don't have nothing to do with gender. Nothing to do with age, military, civilian. Don't have nothing to do with none of that. It's not complicated. You can, if you've prayed that prayer, you save right now. And once you are saved, you are always saved. You can't lose your salvation. That's a whole nother thing. That's been a whole nother controversy among Christians since I remember being a child. People are arguing about whether or not you can lose your salvation. So I'm going to say this and I'm going to be done. I have two children. I have a daughter and a son. My children can't bit more reach inside their cells and pull my DNA out of them. If they wanted to, they couldn't do that. I can't bit more reach inside my cells and pull my father and my mother's DNA out of me if I wanted to. If the DNA in the natural physical body is that strong and that immutable and that unchangeable, how much more the DNA of the spirit? Once you are saved, you are always saved. You can't lose your salvation. You ain't going to never go to hell once you get born again. Now, where people get confused is you might not become everything God wants you to become. You might not finish all of your work in this life. You might not get a full reward. You might not live the way God wants you to live. But that doesn't mean he's not your chi you're not his child. And that's where people get confused. Those are two separate things. ABC makes me his child. Once I'm his child in the spirit, I'm his child forever. The same way I'm my father's child forever. But just because I'm his child doesn't mean I'm an obedient child and I might not end up doing everything he wants me to do. That's different. That don't mean that, that don't mean, that doesn't mean that you're not saved and that doesn't mean when you die, you're going to hell. That's not what that means. It means you're not going to become everything you could have become in this life and that's going to impact the reward you get in the next life. Because so that's, you know, it's, it's more to the subject, like more scriptures and stuff I can show you, but there's not more to the concept. <coughs> concept is simple. Don't be listening to these religious people that tell you there's something you could do to lose your salvation and not be saved. Nothing you could do. Okay? So if you prayed that prayer, welcome to the family. And now it's time to get in the word and get in the spirit and learn. 
learn everything God has for us, okay? All right, I believe the Holy Spirit wants me to re release a prophetic word, hold on. Whew. Uh, I don't know what that was, I think my screensaver popped up, okay. Okay, okay, Holy Ghost just gave me something. Wow, okay, Holy Ghost just said, Holy Ghost just said, look for a new life when all of this is over. And by all of this, the pandemic, 2020, season of judgment, darkness and confusion, Holy Ghost said there's new life. There's new life ahead. Wow, okay, and there's new life right now. Like not, it's coming like in January and February 2021, like right now, right now. So if you've been in a period of darkness, if you've been in a period of judgment, if you've been in a period like that, Holy Ghost says there's new life. He said, look for it. He said, look for it right now. Look for that new life. Even though there's been darkness, the Lord says there's, oh, there's new life. I sure needed that. Praise God for the Holy Ghost. That's why I tell you every week, you need to get in your own prophetic flow. You need the prophetic. You need the prophetic. You need the prophetic. You need the prophetic. That's another one. I don't care what people say. They say uh, there's no more apostles and prophets. Untrue. There's only evangelists, pastors, and teachers now. Untrue. You need the prophetic. Okay? That blessed my heart, and I hope it blessed yours too. Praise and glory to God for the precious Holy Ghost that indwells us. And praise God, God the Spirit, that he freely gives of himself. That's his anointing. The prophetic is his. That's him. And he freely opens it up and gives it to us. All praise and glory to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. All right, that's it for this week. Thank you so much for checking out the Weekly Prophetic Word. I will be back next Sunday, same time, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time for the next Prophetic Word. And I'll be here the second Thursday of November for my next No More Genies 29. Okay, it's episode 29 of No More Genies where we break up our genie concept of God and we get into what the word actually says. Don't forget to get my prophetic, prophetic devotion. There's still two months left in 2020 and you need to be writing down. But do you see how the Holy Ghost just gave me something? You need to write that down. That's what my devotional does. It gives you a journal to write stuff like that down in and also whatever the scripture is for the day, whatever the Holy Ghost gives you for that, it gives you a space to write that down. So pick, pick up my prophetic journal and develop your daily prophetic walk with God because you need the prophetic in your life. Okay? Thank you so much. God bless you. Have a great day. Stop feeling guilty about your flesh. And remember that there's new life, new life right now, even after a period of intense darkness. Amen and amen. I'll see you next time.